Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody. It's a pleasure to have you all here. Thank for our panelists for their generosity to share with us their knowledge from PhD education from different regions in the world. I am Sergio, together with Andre Leon from a Federal University of the State of Pernambuco in Brazil. We'll be organizing this panel. So the idea here is each speaker will go for 10, 12 minutes, and then uh, you please uh, prepare your questions and you may during the session put it up on the Q&A button you have there. So Andre, can you please uh, take it up? Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good night everyone. It's going to be a great opportunity for all of us to hear from you on a such relevant topic. And uh, it's very pleased for all of us. And, uh, Call. Remember everybody to put questions on the Q and A button, button, and uh, after the speakers speak for us, then we can organize our debate. Thank you for all of us. So, uh, you have seen uh, on the website. Our panelists, we're gonna start with Inesh Prasad from uh, Royal University, Canada. He's based in Vancouver. Ash is also editor in chief at Management Learning. He's associate editor at Gender Work and Organization and other relevant journals in, in our field. We then uh, will have Li Lu speaking. Lee is a companion at IFSAMS for the directors. He is director of organization development of, at the PhD program of graduate school of business in the University of Thailand, Assumption University. And he has recently reorganized the PhD program, one of the PhD programs there. So he has very good insights into it. Then we, we're gonna have Monica Sanchez. Monica is at the Autonomous University of Temahualpa, Mexico. She is now current uh, vice president of committees at ACACIA, the management association at Mexico. And she's, uh, she was president in the previous term there. We then will have Birahim Gaye speaking to us. He's from the Gaston Badger University, Senegal, and he's also they're president of the local association, management association. And then uh, we have uh, Lionel Garot from University Paris Dauphine. And uh, he is also their co-director of the executive PhD program. And he's also taking part in the E. Damba, the European Doctoral Program Association in Management and Business Administration. So Lionel can only give us a, a look from French, but also from the European environment. So um, please, uh, I will then pass the word to our earliest riser here, Ash Praza. Thank you very much for being with us. This early in the morning. Thank you, Sergio, for that very uh, generous introduction. Um, like Sergio indicated, um, I am a professor and Canada Research Chair um, 
I'm editor in chief right now, Management Learning, just in case there are doctoral students who are potentially interested in publishing uh, their work in, in a good education journal, as well as associate editor, Human Relations and Gender Working Organization. Um, uh, now, I'm just going to tell a little bit of brief, uh, speak briefly about my educational background to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to sort of contextualize some of this discussion, I'm, but I'm going to keep everything very, very brief so we can get on to the next presenter. Um, I was trained entirely in Canada. Um, so all three of my degrees are from three different Canadian universities. Um, but I spent uh, year-long fellowships in Israel and um, at Hebrew University of Jerusalem and in the United States at Yale. Um, I started my academic career as an assistant professor at the Australian Graduate School of Management at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia, where I was promoted to associate with tenure. I then uh, moved to um, um, Egade Business School at Tecnológico de Monterrey in Mexico City, uh, which is very close to Guajimalpa, right in Santa Fe there, um, where in Mexico I became the youngest ever um, Sistema de National Investigadores Nivel 2. I'm at the age of 30, um, which is a national level ranking. So, um, and I, during that whole process, I've trained PhD students, both in Australia and Mexico and now in Canada. Um, so I'm just bringing in some insights, but I'm mainly going to be talking about how, how things work in Canada. All right. Um, so the Canadian doctoral system in the business school world, the PhD program is very, very similar to the United States. Um, so much of what I'm going to say is probably going to be applicable um, to, to individuals who are trained uh, or who are familiar with the American system. Um, it generally begins with uh, two years of full-time coursework, which is um, then followed by comprehensive exams, then a dissertation and a dissertation defense. Um, the focus, the intention of the PhD program, unlike some schools, particularly in some schools in continental Europe, um, is really to train academics. So generally speaking, if you apply into the doctoral program and you say anything but I want to become an academic, you are not going to get in. It doesn't matter how good your grades are. It doesn't matter how good your standardized test scores are. Um, generally speaking, you are not going to get into a PhD program because the programs are putting in so much investments to trade the next future of of um, a future of the academy. Um, so, uh, so there's a lot of um, collab intense collaboration during your four to six year PhD program um, on, on developing research with faculty members and then co-publishing or publishing on a sole authored, um, uh, publishing them sole authored. Um, so one of my first papers was uh, a paper that I co-authored with my PhD advisor. Um, the other intention is that schools also want to make sure that um, sort of in the American Canadian system, there is a very stringent journal hierarchy as to what qualifies. So the intention will be to be able to develop research during the PhD program that will be placed into certain journals that will then enable students to be placed in very good universities once they're coming out. Because of course, as we all know, the currency of our field are publications. Um, um, so, so that's sort of the, the that's sort of the general nature the intention, the format and the intention of doctoral programs in the Canadian system. Um, the other thing that's important to keep in mind is um, Canadian programs, as well as American programs in the PhD, at the PhD level certainly, is almost always fully funded. That means most schools that will hire, that will, if they accept you, they will fully pay for you to go through the PhD program. You're not going to be living a very high status life, but it is normally sufficient to be able to maintain your expenses. Um, um, so this was unlike, for example, in Australia, where I was at a very good school, but not all PhD students were funded. On the other hand, in Mexico at Igade, every student is also fully funded because it's funded through uh, CONOCIT, um, the, the national funding body there. So, um, um, so it's it, it's very very variable. We are increasingly seeing that schools are 
opening, um, creating DBA programs. The DBA programs are very, very interesting. Uh, I'm not quite sure. I, I don't always think I know what the intention of DBA programs are, at least within the Canadian system. Um, it sometimes seems that um, the DBA program, at least in some, at some schools, is intended for people who have a little bit too much money and they want to be called doctor. And so they create this program that's really intended for, for this group. But in theory, it's, it's intended for professionals who want to specialize in a, in a, who want to explore a question that is much more practice orientated than necessarily than a traditional scholarly question. Um, so they, it's not necessarily intended to try to publish their work in, you know, well-regarded journals, but rather to be able to solve a problem that they drew on from experience, that, that they may have experience in their professional world and their professional history and so forth. Um, the other thing that one uh, should uh, keep in mind when doing a D, uh, when considering a DBA program, at least in the Canadian system, is that generally speaking, unlike the PhD program, it is wholly unfunded. Rarely will there be funding attached to um, to the DBA program, whereas the PhD program not only are you fully funded, but you also have usually have access to, for example, conference support and so forth. So those are the those are the two key differences um, in the in the Canadian system. And the one good thing, at least in the Canadians, and this is the final point that I'll I'll leave I'll, I'll leave here my my talk to. Um, generally speaking. Um, the conditions of the labor market are such that if you have published well, you generally get job offers. So it's not like other disciplines in the social sciences, where if you, even if you've published quite well, you know, if you get a, you know, if you're in sociology or in anthropology or, or a discipline such as that, you may not get a job. Um, if you've published reasonably well, there are sufficient vacancies to be able to accommodate most students. It may not be the job you want for your first job. It may not be the location you want to live in, but normally there will be positions available to you if you've done well during the doctoral program. So on that note, I think I'll, I'll leave it there, Sergio, because I want to make sure that there's sufficient time for others here. Hi. Thanks, Tomas. Thank you so much for your work. So now we leave a room for Lulu. Hi, Lulu again. Thanks for joining us. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm going to use the, the PowerPoint to complete my presentation and take on what a Janish. I'm sorry, I didn't, I probably didn't pronounce your name correctly. Okay, I'm going to share with you the um, PhD program. It was, it was e EBA so-called, but then we made a change seven, eight years ago, uh, 10 years ago, actually. So I would like to share with you what we did uh, in the program here in Thailand at Assumption University. Um, as the world uh, changing rapidly, there's many things happen, technology, globalization, social movement. So there's a need for a different type of researcher uh, because practice and education uh, are not aligned because things are moving too fast. So in our university, the leaders think there are some uh, special needs. So uh, we create the program, we actually have many, um, up to probably 12 PhD programs in our schools. But I'm going to only show you the one I was the program director. And this is uh, what I'm going to show you, uh, some of the details we designed. Okay, we propose to have executive programs uh, aiming to 
help those uh, practitioner to become scholar because as we notice the practice and research and education are not aligned well because of external environment in changing so rapidly. So there must be some uh, solution. Uh, we think the best way is some education system. Luckily, Thai government is pretty much liberal, not like other countries. The government wants to have tightly control what they want. So Thai government, as long as we propose and they agree, then we could execute and implement the program we design. But then they come back to audit according to what our design, our curriculum, to make sure you know, they assess and evaluate to make sure we did what we said. Um, this is the quality assurance program. So every year we have internal quality assurance program ourselves. And our uh, assurance team will be also taking the responsibility to evaluate other schools' PhD program. This is the system in uh, Thailand. Very interesting. Okay, so the purpose to have executive program to develop students to be ethical, accountable, and inspirational leader to lead followers. As we mentioned, um, those are the profession managers that must work in their uh, on their profession job for at least five years, and they should also uh, demonstrate they have at least one year management experience. And we want to enhance students' ability and capability to make changes where it is needed. Usually it's their job first, and then uh, we hope they can uh, take the ownership of uh, social responsibility as well. And as I uh, mentioned earlier, to cultivate students to become a scholar practitioner. In the executive PhD program features, uh, we are in the research phase. Um, they have to publish papers, the students. We, uh, we advocate action research. Uh, also, we require students to combine workshops, international conference, and independent study and supervised dissertation. Uh, we invite lecturers uh, and also supervisor advisors all over around the world. Mostly uh, came from the United States for our PhD program. And also we have a local uh, lecturers, professors. And we, in collaboration, we collaborate with uh, world-class institution, and that's not free. So for Stanford, for uh, other famous high-ranking university in the United States, um, the student have to pay extra for travel and for training for a week up to two weeks. Utilizing knowledge and practice to educate the intelligence with uh, active mind influence others. This is the kind of our mission for this program. Uh, our course is not many, uh, although we would like to have more, but then Thai government said six minimum and maybe sufficient. But then we, we said we want to add prerequisite courses without credit. It could be up to six. For example, our clinical, uh, not clinical, uh, consultative psychology PhD program. They add, I think, a course. So it is subject to student background. And we want to make sure they are capable and well accomplish the requirement as the PhD, OD, PhD program required. So co course, they are six, 18 credits, dissertation, 36 credits. 36 credits, total 54. And the other requirements as two international conference and two uh, workshops. And this just give you a snapshot about what I mentioned, 10 course. This, this is what we demonstrate to our students internal. Executive PhD program schemes. 
a hybrid course session 36 hours for two weeks. So one course is 36 hours in two weekends. Papers are needed, uh, every courses and also paper writing. Courses and workshops are scheduled every other month. And there are many free training online, online sessions students can uh, get on or the uh, supervisor can advise them. QE, qualify exam um, can be started when course, are, course have been completed. And then, um, you know, then student can start to attend international conference, but this has to be uh, pre-approved by the program directors. And also the uh, workshop. We offer, we actually offer a PhD workshop once every month. So this is not a mandate, but uh, many students, they participate. We invite, we actually invite the student who passed the final uh, defense is it they can come back to share, not necessarily the content of the dissertation. It's all about the uh, journey of uh, how they you know, work on their dissertation. I think that that's more important to many uh, the students who start at the first year. Actual research is required to be applied in the relevant, uh, relevant context. Final dissertation must be presented online. We use five chapter format. Uh, this is the admission uh, requirement. No difference than other school, but our, uh, I think our, we lower our bar, but we more focus on African working experience and their, their, um, willingness to finish this program. And their paper, dissertation paper needs to be published. We list some of those international, national. Um, this is not high ranking, but you know, consider in considering uh, the student, they are actually practitioner and want to add knowledge, research knowledge to them so they, they can become a researcher. Uh, if they want to become scholar, they have to work harder, a researcher. At least they, <clears throat> they, they are able to conduct research with, the, with their practices or uh, organization they could identify as a partnership. Okay, this is in my presentation and I'm looking forward to have mm. more in depth and wider discussion later with all of you. Thank you. Thanks, Lee. Thank you very much. Uh, well, before moving on our next panelist, I remind the audience to submit the questions in the Q&A button below. So after the uh, panelists speak for us, we can begin discussing your questions. Well, now I invite Monica Sanchez to make a presentation. Thanks again, Monica, for, for joining us. Thanks. Gracias. Voy a compartir la presentación. <laughs> bueno, muy bien. Eh, trataré de um, hacer algo así como un portuñol, este que es algo así como mi castellano y, y pues el portugués. Eh, una disculpa por los que están presentando en inglés, eh, pero bueno, pues muchísimo gusto y la verdad eh, me encanta que me hayan este, invitado y ser eh, la representante del género femenino en este caso. Y efectivamente, bueno, pues uh, mi trayectoria tiene que ver con 25 años trabajando en la educación superior, eh, 15 de ellos en el Sistema Nacional de Investigadores, nivel 2. Sí es cierto que como el doctor Prasad, eh, el cual felicito, no ingresé en el nivel 2 a los 31 años, pero casi a los 40. Entonces, bueno, pues este... En mi reconocimiento para él. 
Y bueno, pues uh, quiero comentarles, en este caso vengo con la representación de la Academia de Ciencias Administrativas, fui presidenta por cuatro años, actualmente estoy como vicepresidenta, he estado participando en la Federación Mundial desde hace algunos uh, años, recientemente eh, fui, eh, digamos, uh, eh, punta de lanza para el regreso al IFSAM, ya la, feder la academia había estado algunos años y bueno, regreso aquí. Eh, mi participación el día de hoy también tiene mucho que ver con, estuve eh, coordinando un doctorado eh, ya hace algún tiempo, un doctorado eh, reconocido por el eh, CONACIT en el Padrón Nacional de Posgrado de Investigadores y a mí me gustaría compartirles eh, la experiencia. En este caso me gustaría compartirles qué es lo que sucede con el posgrado en México. Y bueno, eh, en este caso tenemos, particularmente me gustaría eh, compartirles un diagnóstico del posgrado que se hizo a nivel nacional por parte del eh, doctor Marcial Bonilla Marín, quien coordinó estos trabajos y que fueron a partir de, lo que, eh, de los posgrados del CONACYT. En los posgrados a nivel México, en la parte privada corresponden al 59%, en la parte pública al 41%. No significa que estamos hablando solamente del doctorado, estamos hablando de las uh, licenciaturas, así como de las maestrías, perdón, de las maestrías y de las uh, especialidades y de los doctorados. Como ustedes observan, hay el 57%, 59% de la parte privada. Esto que es lo que denota que el, el sector privado tiene interés por participar justamente en la formación de capital humano. Se tarda un poquito en, en avanzar. La educación doctoral en México básicamente está regida por el Consejo Nacional de Ciencia y Tecnología. A partir de 1991, crea un padrón nacional de posgrado, así le llama, PNPC. ¿Y esto qué significa? Que ese padrón es quien acredita los posgrados, las maestrías, los doctorados. Y lo distribuye en cuatro, en este caso, en su clasificación de cuatro niveles. El que apenas acaba de comenzar, el que está en su fase de, de desarrollo, el que está en su fase de consolidación y el que ya es de competencia internacional, que en su gran mayoría tiene doble titulación con algunos doctorados del extranjero. Para 2014 se incorpora, en este caso, eh, la orientación profesional de los doctorados porque era principalmente de investigación. Entonces, actualmente tenemos los doctorados profesionalizantes, además de los de investigación. En, 2002, en 2021 hay un parteaguas y anuncia que, es, que el CONACYT, que el PNPC, va a ser sustituido por un sistema nacional de posgrados. Actualmente lo que está sucediendo es que estamos este, en una etapa de transición y esa transición tiene que ver con que ahora hay diferentes modalidades y está reenfocando todas las investigaciones de todos los miembros del Sistema Nacional de Investigadores a dos áreas específicas, al área número 3 y al área número 5. Si bien es cierto, hay siete desde el fortalecimiento de procesos sociocomunitarios, atención a problemas estructurales, pero ahorita eh, principalmente es hacia las áreas afines a los programas nacionales estratégicos, que son los PRONACES, ahorita se los voy a mencionar, y a la ciencia básica y de frontera. Sin embargo, bueno, como quiera, siguen en el fortalecimiento de la cultura, las especialidades médicas y los posgrados con la industria. Y estos son los PRONACES, nos están reenfocando, por ejemplo, eh, mi línea de investigación, tecnología, innovación, gestión del conocimiento. Eh, en este caso trabajo mucho eh, sobre el tema de emprendimiento. Aquí los PRONACES tienen que ver con agentes tóxicos y procesos contaminantes, agua, cultura, educación, energía y cambio climático, salud, seguridad humana, sistemas socioecológicos, la soberanía alimentaria y la vivienda. Y todo esto se está alineando con los Objetivos de Desarrollo Sostenible. Recordemos, 2015 la ONU aprueba la Agenda, Agenda 2030 con sus 17 objetivos. Entonces, básicamente lo que está haciendo es alineando y llevando a todos sus investigadores a que todos trabajemos sobre estos, estos programas estratégicos. 
¿Qué es lo que está sucediendo? Que, por ejemplo, eh, los doctorados están distribuidos por área de conocimiento en ingenierías, en las ciencias sociales, humanidades y ciencias de la conducta, biología y química, biotecnología, ciencias agropecuarias, psicomatemáticas y ciencias de la tierra, medicina y ciencias de la salud. En este caso, nosotros que somos los que estamos en ciencias de la salud, con 157 doctorados reconocidos por el Padrón Nacional de Posgrado todavía actualmente, y lo, el cual nos permite, todo, todo lo dirige en este caso el Padrón Nacional de Posgrado, todos los alumnos están becados, son alumnos de tiempo completo, eh, todos los, los doctores tenemos ese reconocimiento del Sistema Nacional de Investigadores, quienes participamos en esos doctorados, bajamos recursos a través del Padrón Nacional de Posgrado para los proyectos en los cuales involucramos a los alumnos en sus respectivas tesis, todas enfocadas hacia Ciencias de la Frontera o hacia los PRONACES. ¿Qué es lo que sucede con Ciencias Sociales? Ahorita tenemos una fuerte crítica porque no hay correspondencia entre, uh, en este caso, lo que estamos estudiando y en este caso lo que estamos publicando. Número uno, hay una fuerte crítica porque nuestras publicaciones no, es, no, son, no están eh, en igual, digamos, número que los demás áreas en, uh, en revistas de calidad. Y es que lo que sucede es que el número de revistas de calidad, que estaríamos hablando de los journal, este, no, hay, no hay tantas en específico en las ciencias sociales como en las demás áreas. Y entonces eso se nos está dificultando. Entonces tenemos esa fuerte crítica, además de que el grupo de, de, los, de los que estamos dentro del Sistema Nacional de Investigadores también tenemos a su vez eh, puesta sobre la mesa que los, las, los temas, en este caso del PRONACES, no tienen, eh, digamos, mucho que ver con nuestras áreas específicas o nuestras temáticas específicas o nuestra línea de investigación. Entonces, bueno, pues, uh, digamos, estamos en esa transición y, bueno, en, efe, en efecto, eh, tenemos claro que el, la educación doctoral nos da mayor conocimiento y habilidades y lo que estamos buscando también es proponer esas soluciones a los diversos problemas que afectan a nuestro país. Y básicamente lo que están um, haciendo con los investigadores es que uh, nos lleven hacia la solución de las problemáticas en nuestro alrededor, hacia nuestra comunidad. Y pues contribuir al desarrollo de la sociedad en las diferentes áreas de las ciencias, las humanidades y las artes. La educación doctoral en México, como les decía hace un momento, en su mayoría es de investigación y no tanto profesionalizante. Aquí les muestro unos datos de 2015 a 2022 proporcionados por el CONACID y los cuales ustedes ven que las, los doctorados profesionalizantes son muy pocos reconocidos por el Sistema Nacional, perdón, por el Padrón Nacional de Posgrado. Y bueno, pues uh, sí es cierto uh, lo que comentaba hace un momento. Estos uh, doctorados profesionalizantes vienen a cubrir la demanda que realizan las personas que pretenden mejorar en su trabajo a través de mejorar o aumentar sus habilidades o sus capacidades para aportar en sus respectivas empresas. La educación doctoral en México, bueno, pues en su proporción tiene el 17% de adultos que son entre 25 y 64 años. Eh, en cambio, la proporción promedio del 37% entre los países que conforman la, la, la OCDE en este caso, de 17 a 37%, como ven ustedes, pues hay una clara diferencia. La contratación de egresados eh, jóvenes en México es de 80%, casi 81%, que es inferior al promedio de la OCDE, 84%. En el caso de México, el principal destino laboral de, los, de estos nuevos doctores es el sector académico, principalmente las universidades, llámese públicas, llámese privadas, eh, centros de investigación, seguidos por el sector gubernamental y al último el sector empresarial. El sector, empresarial, el sector empresarial no tiene tanto interés en contratar este, justamente pues, doctores. Las principales problemáticas del posgrado en México sigue siendo la falta de interés de los sectores productivo y gubernamental para apoyar la formación de capital humano de alto nivel. Hay insuficiente número y monto de becas institucionales, 
falta de reconocimiento por parte de la sociedad, falta de oportunidades de trabajo para los egresados y hay una baja movilidad estudiantil. Lo que está sucediendo este, este, en este momento a partir de 2021, que es donde, donde se habla de esta sustitución del Padrón Nacional de, de posgrado por el Sistema Nacional, es que uh, reconoce o, o digamos, uh, con mayor valía el que la movilidad estudiantil sea a nivel nacional y no a nivel internacional. Entonces, esto, pues, eh, digamos, estamos en transición y, pues, básicamente estamos haciendo esos ajustes y, pues, sí, no, sí es algo preocupante para nosotros y, pues, para la comunidad en general. Y, pues, el mayor reto, como lo es, es identificar y caracterizar las problemáticas y las barreras que se presentan en estos posgrados para contar con un posgrado de altos estándares de calidad y pertinencia. Bueno, pues sería mi aportación. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you, Monica. Uh, once again, I remember the audience to uh, elaborate questions and, and put it at the Q&A button. Well, uh, now I wish to, to invite and give floor to uh, excuse me, be if I not spelling your name very well, <laughs> but uh, I, I make the floor for you, Birahi Thanks for joining us. Uh, merci, uh, André. Uh, merci à tous uh, d'être là ce matin. Uh, je suis désolé de uh, parler en français. Uh, je pense que ça aurait été plus uh, facile de parler en anglais pour permettre à une majorité de personnes participant à ce panel de pouvoir uh, mieux saisir le propos que je vais tenir. Uh, J'espère que à travers les uh, commentaires qui seront faits par Sergio ou par d'autres, uh, une majorité de personnes pourront uh, mieux me suivre. Uh, il est question ici de parler des dynamiques de changement uh, de la formation doctorale uh, à travers le monde. Uh, moi, je vais vous parler plus spécifiquement du contexte uh, africain, Afrique francophone et uh, sénégalais. Uh, Il est précisé dans euh, la présentation euh, de ce panel euh, qu'il convient de discuter euh, de euh, l'apparition euh, des doctorats professionnels, les DBA, on en a parlé tout à l'heure avec euh, le professeur Passat, euh, face aux doctorats classiques PhD euh, qui ont une orientation beaucoup plus monographique Euh, qu'en est-il du Sénégal, qu'en est-il de l'Afrique, euh, il se convient de dire que, euh, effectivement, euh, cette dynamique est actuelle ici, avec euh, des tentatives qu'on a pu déceler par ce par là euh, notamment euh, du fait euh, d'acteurs internationaux qui sont venus sur le contexte sénégalais proposer des euh, DBA. Euh, il y a aussi des établissements privés qui ont euh, proposé ce type de, de, de doctorat. Uh, mais ce n'a pas pris parce que les autorités au niveau institutionnel n'ont pas laissé prospérer uh, ces initiatives, je veux dire par là le CAMES. Le CAMES, c'est le Conseil africain et malgache uh, de l'enseignement supérieur, qui est l'instance uh, par excellence uh, de valorisation, d'encadrement et uh, d'évaluation uh, de tout ce qui relève de l'enseignement supérieur dans le contexte uh, africain. Euh, notamment africain francophone. Euh, mais il convient, euh, pour parler de ces dynamiques, euh, de revenir sur un élément qui me semble important euh, et qui a été d'ailleurs cité, en fait, précisé par le livre blanc de l'Agence universitaire de la francophonie en 2017, euh, concernant les fonctions de la recherche. Euh, je partage avec euh, ce livre blanc l'idée selon laquelle euh, la recherche vise Euh, la construction, l'acquisition, la valorisation des savoirs scientifiques, euh, la construction de biens collectifs, la construction d'avantages compétitifs, l'enrichissement des contenus de formation ou encore euh, la diffusion de la culture scientifique et le développement personnel ainsi que l'accomplissement euh, de soi des chercheurs. Euh, quand on convient de cela, il nous revient alors 
de nous préoccuper de la qualité de la formation doctorale, euh, qui doit donc occuper une place euh, importante dans les stratégies de développement euh, dans toutes les universités africaines et bien sûr euh, dans les universités euh, publiques euh, francophones. C'est fort de cela que euh, je souhaite en trois temps euh, vous parler de l'état des lieux, euh, qu'est-ce qui se fait actuellement et quelles sont les évolutions majeures que nous pouvons euh, constater dans le contexte africain. Ensuite, euh, je reviendrai sur euh, euh, quelques dysfonctionnements, quelques problèmes qui me semblent importants à souligner euh, avant euh, de souligner euh, quelques défis euh, pour la fin. Euh, en termes d'état des lieux, euh, bien sûr, en Afrique francophone, euh, dans une volonté euh, d'harmonisation avec euh, l'enseignement supérieur au niveau mondial, il a été adopté dans beaucoup d'États le système LMD, licence, master, doctorat, euh, qui euh, se veut euh, un cadre euh, favorisant euh, la circulation des étudiants, euh, favorisant euh, l'homogénéisation des diplômes et le fait de permettre à ce que euh, qu'il y ait des dynamiques euh, communes euh, entre ce qui se fait en Afrique et ailleurs. Euh, je dois également euh, parler de l'institutionnalisation progressive euh, des écoles doctorales euh, qui devient euh, le cadre organisationnel par excellence des parcours doctoraux. Euh, avant, c'était au niveau des facultés euh, que la formation doctorale se euh, faisait de manière exclusive. Aujourd'hui, il y a ces structures qui sont euh, institutionnalisées, euh, mais cela pose, une, euh, selon moi, une ambiguïté de rôle. Euh, les facultés et les UFR, les unités de formation et de recherche, qui continuent d'assurer le financement et l'inscription des étudiants et qui aspire à avoir une responsabilité par rapport euh, à ces parcours de euh, Il faut aussi souligner, euh, et je pense que c'est quelque chose d'important, de plus en plus la création de formations doctorales, euh, mais qui se retrouve sans contenu ou avec des contenus qui sont euh, conçus, euh, définis, mais non exécutés. Et ça, ça pose un véritable problème. Je reviendrai sur les conséquences de l'absence de ce contenu de formation doctorale parce que ça crée une certaine hétérogénéité euh, par rapport aux euh, recherches doctorales et euh, avec des conséquences qui peuvent être parfois euh, très, très négatives. Euh, je reviens sur euh, quelque chose aussi de très important en contexte africain parce que dans la littérature académique, on a toujours tendance à souligner euh, le faible nombre de personnel en capacité d'encadrer les recherches doctorales. Aujourd'hui, euh, on a quand même un corps professoral euh, des enseignants-chercheurs euh, de euh, pouvant les de permettre d'encadrer des doctorats qui sont de plus en plus importants. Ce n'est pas encore suffisant. Euh, le taux d'encadrement reste encore très faible. Comparé à quelques années, on a avec... Euh, euh, CAMES a enregistré un nombre assez conséquent de professeurs encadrant des docteurs ou des doctorants. Ça pose un autre problème. Euh, la tendance ou la propension de ces enseignants-chercheurs à tous créer une formation doctorale avec un déficit de contrôle social, euh, ce qui peut euh, engendrer des dérives et des travers assez considérables, malheureusement. Euh, un des éléments qui me semble important à citer euh, dans cet état des lieux euh, constitue, euh, je l'ai dit tantôt, la non-reconnaissance par le CAMES. Euh, donc, j'ai parlé tout à l'heure du CAMES comme étant un cadre régional euh, qui harmonise et encadre l'enseignement supérieur. Euh, ni le CAMES, ni l'ANAC-SUP, qui est l'autorité nationale au Sénégal, chargé d'assurer la qualité de l'enseignement supérieur, ne reconnaissent euh, les thèses professionnelles, donc les DBA. Aujourd'hui, si vous faites un DBA au Sénégal, ce n'est pas reconnu par ces autorités institutionnelles. Euh, de la même manière, euh, le CAMES ne reconnaît pas les thèses par article. Euh, Quelqu'un ne pourrait pas faire des thèses par article parce qu'on risquerait de ne pas être euh, considéré comme relevant d'une thèse véritable. Euh, donc, cette situation ainsi décrite euh, m'amène à considérer un certain nombre de problèmes et de dysfonctionnements. 
Euh, D'abord, je pense que c'est le plus important, l'absence de mécanismes d'évaluation des formations doctorales. Euh, je l'ai dit tout à l'heure, le CAMES est un cadre important qui encadre et qui harmonise les formations, mais spécifiquement pour ce qui est des études doctorales, notamment dans le domaine du management, euh, il y a une absence euh, claire de mécanismes d'évaluation, euh, ce qui euh, entraîne une qualité variable de la production. Vous pouvez avoir de très bonnes thèses produites, mais vous pouvez aussi avoir des documents euh, qui ne peuvent être considérés comme étant des doctorats à proprement parler. Euh, un taux d'encadrement encore faible, euh, parce que euh, j'ai parlé tout à l'heure du système LMD qui a été adopté, euh, et la conséquence euh, qui est une libéralisation euh, de euh, l'instruction en thèse pour coût titulaire de master. Et là aussi, euh, il y a une demande très forte, notamment de personnes euh, qui sont dans le domaine professionnel, qui veulent faire des thèses de doctorat euh, dans nos différentes universités, et cela euh, contribue à réduire davantage le taux d'encadrement. Euh, les doctorants sans formation initiale, ni dans le domaine d'inscription, ni par rapport aux fondamentaux de la recherche. Donc, on se retrouve avec des doctorants qui, ni dans leur parcours initial, ni par rapport à la euh, formation, à la recherche à proprement parler, n'ont pas été initiés et qui se retrouvent euh, avec beaucoup de difficultés pour absorber euh, les exigences de la recherche académique. Donc, là aussi, ça constitue, de mon point de vue, un problème important à considérer. Et tout cela aussi euh, est accentué par, euh, désolé un peu de le dire, euh, par parfois des rapports euh, préalables à la soutenance de thèse de euh, complaisance. Parfois, on peut se retrouver avec euh, des thèses qui euh, ont été élaborées de manière hâtive ou n'ont pas fait l'objet euh, d'une évaluation rigoureuse, ce qui se traduit malheureusement par, comme je l'ai dit tantôt, euh, une qualité de production en deçà de ce qui est convenu euh, d'attendre d'une euh, recherche doctorale. Euh, et je pense que tout cela euh, est encouragé aussi par l'absence euh, d'un système national cohérent de formation de programme en management, euh, une hyperfragmentation de l'offre de formation en doctorat. Aujourd'hui, on a des sujets qui sont déconnectés euh, des réalités socio-économiques, euh, des sujets qui ignorent euh, les enjeux de société. Euh, il y a des problèmes importants en Afrique, des questions sur la pauvreté, sur euh, l'entrepreneuriat euh, de manière large, sur euh, les changements climatiques, euh, sur euh, euh, l'interconnexion entre euh, les genres dans le milieu de l'entreprise, euh, les questions de caste ou autres, qui sont de véritables problèmes qui gangrènent euh, les, euh, les environnements euh, dans nos entreprises, mais qui ne sont pas du tout pris en charge par la recherche. Et c'est cela qui m'amène euh, enfin euh, à parler des défis euh, qui me semblent nécessaires à euh, prendre en charge si on veut améliorer euh, l'enseignement supérieur euh, de manière générale et euh, la formation doctorale en particulier. Euh, tout d'abord, euh, mettre en place euh, euh, des procédures d'admission au doctorat qui soient plus rigoureuses, euh, vérifier que les candidats ont les prérequis nécessaires pour s'inscrire en nouveau doctorat. Euh, élaborer euh, des projets de recherche, pas par l'étudiant, mais par les enseignants qui s'impliqueraient davantage dans l'élaboration avec des thèses ayant des modalités de financement clairement identifiées dès le départ pour permettre à l'étudiant de pouvoir s'engager en doctorat avec euh, des perspectives de se concentrer dans sa recherche doctorale. Aujourd'hui, les étudiants en thèse sont dispersés par plusieurs activités et cela empêche euh, d'avoir des tests de qualité. Euh, le deuxième élément qui me semble important, c'est le processus d'habilitation et d'accréditation des écoles doctorales. Euh, je pense que c'est cela qui favoriserait la qualité et la pertinence de l'offre doctorale, qui permettrait une euh, capacitation des institutions qui délivrent les formations doctorales, aussi bien sur les plans organisationnels, pédagogiques que financiers. Euh, un autre défi important, selon moi, est l'harmonisation progressive des offres de formation doctorale à l'échelle euh, sous-régionale. Aujourd'hui, vous avez des qualités de doctorat variables d'une université à une autre, d'une école doctorale à une autre. 
d'un enseignant à un autre, selon les exigences des uns et des autres. Et je pense que si cela ne se fait pas, il n'y aurait pas une exigence de rigueur scientifique. On ne pourrait pas s'attendre à avoir des contributions scientifiques et ou managériales de euh, niveau considérable. Euh, on n'aurait pas euh, des compétences euh, renforcées de la part des jeunes chercheurs qui euh, produisent des doctorats. Euh, il n'y aurait pas de retombées. Je pense qu'on doit s'attendre à des retombées. Euh, J'ai ai bien aimé tout à l'heure euh, l'intervention de Lui euh, qui expliquait l'importance d'avoir euh, au moins deux communications à des congrès internationaux ou bien avoir la possibilité de publier dans les revues de, de rang majeur. Euh, cela est nécessaire euh, pour avoir des tests de qualité. Euh, avoir des dispositifs d'accompagnement, euh, par exemple à l'entrepreneuriat, qui devrait sortir de ces doctorats. Euh, un élément important euh, parmi ces défis, c'est l'insertion professionnelle des doctorats. Aujourd'hui, ils sont nombreux les docteurs qui produisent des thèses, mais qui, soit par défaut de qualité ou bien par défaut d'offre d'emploi, n'arrivent pas à trouver un emploi euh, aussi bien dans les universités que dans le privé. Euh, on pensait avec euh, le privé avoir des débouchés, mais ceci n'est pas le cas euh, malheureusement. Euh, en conclusion, euh, il me revient avec euh, le livre blanc euh, de l'AUF, euh, de souligner quatre nécessités absolues. Et j'aimerais vraiment euh, mettre le focus sur ces euh, nécessités. Euh, premièrement, l'harmonisation de l'organisation des études doctorales, du mode d'évaluation et des conditions de délivrance du doctorat. Euh, deuxièmement, l'homogénéisation des parcours doctoraux à l'échelle sous-régionale. Euh, troisièmement, euh, la garantie de la qualité et de la pertinence des formations doctorales et enfin euh, donner au doctorat un contenu et des atouts visibles et reconnus par les différentes parties prenantes. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Birain. And uh, to conclude this first part of uh, this round table, I invite Lionel Gaho. Thanks, Lionel. Hello, everybody. Thank you, André, for your introduction. Um, so, yeah, I'm uh, a scholar in France and I'm taking part in two. Uh, uh, I'm very much involved into the PhD program that we develop at Dauphine PSL. Uh, but, uh, and just to, to say one word uh, for Sergio, I'm not a member of EDAMBA, but a member of the EDBA Council. So I can give an overview of uh, what we see from the Uh, EDBA Council that gathers uh, executive uh, uh, doctoral programs uh, here. And, uh, and as I co-chair the executive PhD program in Dauphine, I can give you some um, yeah, information about what we have done over the last years in order to, to run this program. So first, um, in order to, to be able to compare uh, with what, we, what my colleagues have said uh, in other continents, Uh, I think that something that is very important in France is that when people do a doctorate, a traditional doctorate uh, that you call a PhD, but in France, we don't have that much the PhD program. We have the national uh, degree that is called doctorate. Uh, people start with when they are quite junior. Most of the time they are 22, 23, 24 year old, uh, which is much younger to what we can see in the UK or in Germany, for example. Uh, in countries in which people start about 28 to, to 30, generally speaking. So uh, this is the first difference that, uh, that we have to, to consider. Something that is very important, and I think that this is maybe not exactly the same, but it really looks like what Birain said about Africa. We have a real problems about funding these programs in the French public universities. Why do we have these problems? Because uh, just like Anish said, uh, we do pay the PhD student, okay? They are paid by the university to develop their uh, PhD work, or they are paid by companies or public institutions to pay, uh, to, to do this. But basically about, let's say more than half of them are paid by the university. Um, and then we have very, low budget in order to develop courses in the PhD programs in France, okay? Basically, when I have done my PhD uh, about uh, 
17 years ago, um, we had about two or three weeks of teaching all along the three years of PhD program, okay? Let's say half a day there, half a day there, okay? But there was no real teaching because historically, a uh, doctorate program in France is considered as an individual journey uh, that you have to train yourself to think on your own. So there was no such courses as what we can see in the traditional PhD program in North America, for example, or in the UK. And this is also due because we have part of these courses at the master level, because we have very strong master degrees that are research oriented and that for one year, students have uh, about 450 hours of teaching about research. So they know about methods, they know about theory once they graduate from their master degree. And so the PhD itself uh, is not that much um, full or filled, sorry, with, uh, with courses. What I can witness is that we have less and less candidates in the traditional PhD program in France, okay? One of the main issue we have is that, uh, for example, I just discussed uh, yesterday, you know, we have this uh, master degree defense or dissertation defense at the moment. Uh, my students that just go out of, of, uh, of the master degree that I run, they earn more than I do earn at the public university, okay? They are, they are just 23 year old and they earn more than what we are paid in a public university. So basically you don't get the best people getting a PhD in public universities because you know, they know that they won't get paid that much if they stay in the traditional system. So of course, some of them go abroad. Some of them go to some very famous business school in which they can earn more. But if we think about the public system, Basically, my own student, one week after they graduate, they earn about 50% more than I do earn in a year, okay? So that's quite an issue in order to, uh, to keep the best student uh, in PhD programs. So what is interesting is that we have more and more companies that realize that it's very interesting to have PhD students working on, a, on, a, um, on an issue that they propose. So we have more and more companies that fund uh, PhD students, and uh, as the companies pay them, pay them uh, the students can have a better wage than the traditional wage they would get uh, by the university. So that's something that, that is very interesting. And I think that just like all of you have said, uh, the traditional PhD program is more and more oriented towards publication. So our students have to publish during their uh, PhD time, uh, they can do a dissertation based on publication if they want, or they can have a traditional dissertation and additional uh, publication. So now let's move from my, my role as a member of the EDBA Council. So the EDBA Council is an association that, um, let's say, represents executive PhD, executive DBA and DBA programs, let's say, all around the world. What we can see is that um, we have more and more executive programs all around the world, okay? Uh, we have more than 300 programs now that are affiliated with the EDBA Council, okay? Uh, when I, I started being in charge of the EDBA program uh, in uh, 2014 at Dauphine, there was about 70 programs like this around the world, okay? Now we have more than 300 that are affiliated to the EDBA Council, okay? So it's just booming at the moment. Uh, I do acknowledge, okay, and this is one of the role of the EDBA Council, that there are very strong differences between the executive doctorates around the world. Some don't, do not even require empirical work, okay? You have, EDBA or executive PhD program that propose a program that is just a systematic literature review, okay? Which from my view and what I try to, 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 to push uh, at the EDBA council is not something that is acceptable uh, for a doctoral uh, 
uh, degree. Uh, but other programs, uh, and I do not only think about the one I run, but I think about uh, some programs in, in, in Belgium, for example, some programs in Asia and some programs in the US as well. Uh, they are very, they have very high expectations. Okay. So it means that the, the differences between the EDBA or the executive PhD program, they are huge. Okay. And so the role of the EDBA council that has emerged is to move from a representative body to a kind of labeling body, okay? So the EDBA Council is thinking about norms for people to, uh, or for programs to join the EDBA Council. And if the programs don't meet the norms or expectation, they may not be able to join the Council anymore, okay? Because there are too, too much difference between uh, the expectation. Some people even say at the EDBA Council, low expectation doesn't mean no expectation, which to me just shows that uh, it's not it's it's not really serious to to, to consider uh, to consider this. It becomes just a product that we sell, uh, much more than a program in order to train people. So so yeah, so we have everything. Some people do very good work. Some people just have very low expectation and I think we need to normalize this a little bit. So this also goes with what Biraim said about uh, accreditation bodies that should play a role in order to show the, the quality of the, of the program. Um, but what is interesting as well, and just I think maybe Anish has such, such a, um, uh, let's say an experience, um, you know, in universities or in business schools, in which the DBA or in which the executive PhD program is not that good, uh, scholars don't want to, to be involved in there, okay? And that's a very good sign. If you have people from your own institution that want to be involved in there, it means that it has a good reputation and that the expectations are good because researchers find something in order to think and to make research uh, while supervising such uh, programs and projects. So what I can tell you about our program uh, at Dauphine PSL, um, we have more and more senior people, uh, which is something that we didn't have about 10 years ago. We had, about, we had middle managers, let's say, that wanted to, um, to, to, to develop their career. And we have more and more senior people, like CEO of, uh, let's say, medium companies. Um, we have vice president of world groups like Unilever of, or Danone or, you know, these kind of companies that are well known. Uh, we have, for example, the, the marketing director of uh, LVMH uh, in Asia, for example. So we have very senior people that, uh, that, join, uh, that join our programs. And we have more and more politicians that have a career in the private market and that become politicians and so uh, I believe that there are dual effects. Uh, they want to stay uh, into the, let's say, uh, private mindset. And at the same time, uh, I think that in many countries, just as Anish said, uh, having the title of being a doctor is very important uh, for political reasons as well. Our program is based on 48 full days of courses uh, about half of them being on-site and half of them being now uh, online because we have more and more people that come from Asia, from Africa, from Canada. And so we decided to uh, not make people come every month as we used to do, but in order to limit the uh, climate or the environmental impact, we have decided to, 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 to make one session in, um, in the university, one session online. What is very important for us is that we have external reviewers, which means that for the dissertation, for the defense, we do not allow our own students to defend or not. We ask, just like in the traditional doctorate uh, program in France, we ask external people to allow or not uh, the defense. So we can also benchmark because it's the same researchers that are in the committees in the traditional doctorate program and in the in these kind of uh, executive PhD programs, so we can benchmark, you know, what we do and and compare 
uh, with um, with traditional uh, doctorate program. And we were very, maybe not surprised, but very happy that many of our colleagues told us that, oh yeah, uh, what you're doing with the EDBA program that is now called the Executive PhD program at Dauphine is very good because it's the same quality than a traditional doctorate pro doctoral program. And that's something that we believe is a, is a good sign uh, that we uh, reach the same uh, kind of quality uh, between traditional and uh, executive uh, PhD program. But I have to tell you that they suffer a lot, okay? They do not imagine when they apply, how much work it is and how much they will suffer. But we, in the information session, we just tell them, okay, if you want a DBA just because you want to be called doctor, go to some other programs. You won't be happy in the film. If you want to have a real intellectual adventure, you can join, you will suffer, but within three to four to five years, you will be very happy. But in the, in the meantime, it, it can be quite hard. So it means that we have people from all around the world, but we take about 10 to 12 to maximum 15 people per year. Okay. And that helps us having very good quality. What we can see also is that more and more companies fund this type of program for their own top managers. Okay. That's also a good sign because companies see that they have an interest in developing this research state of mind in their own uh, managers. And what we can also notice is that more and more of these senior manager work on some topics that are associated with the grand challenges. So we have many research on management of water, uh, recycling plastic bottles, or these kind of things, uh, feminism, as much uh, as well, uh, quite much. Uh, so that's also a sign that, you know, in the top management, people want to take some time to reflect about real important issues. And they can find in the type of program that we propose a space and also some time to think about important issues for the future. Um, so just to, to finish, um, what we can see is that more and more of our alumni go to business school and they have not only part-time position, but mo most of them, not maybe not most of them, but about half of the one that go to business school, they have full-time position as scholars, not only as teachers, okay? So they keep on doing research, okay? That's very important. And more and more of our alumni keep on publishing once they have graduated, which is also a good sign that, so most of the time it's co-writing with a real, uh, not real, but with a senior uh, researcher, uh, because yeah, the, the codes and the norms, they don't have them, okay? But based on their dissertation, we can make very good publication and that's in my view also a very good sign. So that was my three points and I hope it was like insightful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ranel. Well, before we move on to the questions, I give the floor back to Sergio. Uh, Lionel, please help me wrapping up main ideas that Ibrahim put out so we can uh, share with the audience in English. So uh, Ibrahim has uh, mentioned uh, some problems in the African system. Birahim, I'll try to wrap up in a few words in English and I asked Lionel to help me out. He did mention some of the sure. questions you put and uh, it's good that the last two panelists from our panel have uh, two completely different positions about the DBA. So in France, uh, it's getting up, whereas in Senegal, uh, the institutional organizations are not allowing, right, Birahim, the DBA programs to be allowed. And uh, there is this issue of, you mentioned uh, at the end of your statement that the main problems are to harmonize the evaluation. You said that, uh, so the programs have uh, something in written, 
but the full content may not be delivered. And the, the most dangerous thing is that uh, you have that the evaluation of the PhD program is not duly made. So there is the institutional control, but then at the end, uh, you, get, you do get some good uh, dissertations, but some that you would not consider to be a full scale research. And also you mentioned that uh, there is this, I think it's also what Monica said, the detachment from some of the research to your local reality. So important issues for the society like poverty and uh, deterioration environment are not taken into consideration what you call the pertinence of, uh, of the research. It's, uh, it's a, a, a very important problem and that uh, during the program, uh, the students during the PhD program, they are not allowed to have focus on their own research. They are diverted in many different directions and they are not uh, given full time nor funding to dedicate to their research. And then at the end of the program, it's very hard for them to find a, a job. And you did mention that uh, though the quality of professors are moving up, you are still in lack of quantity and, and quality for the professors to fully dedicate to a PhD program. I liked when you said that the hyper fragmentation of, of the students having to deal with uh, different directions. And uh, anything else, Lionel, we should add for our I, I think you delivered the, I think you delivered the core of my message. Uh, I think you have to, uh, presenting uh, what I would like to uh, share with participants. Uh, it's very okay. Thank you, Sergio. And uh, also an important point was on this, uh, before PG programs were running faculties and now there is this Ecole Doctorale trying to PhD schools, trying to raise up, but it's still not fully accredited by institutional level, right? This is still was this system. Lionel, anything else you'd remember there? No, I think also be mindful about like accreditation bodies, you know, that should play a role in standardizing uh, the quality and taking out of the market, the, let's say, the programs that don't meet the requirement. And I think that's a, um, that's something important in in Birheim's point of view. All right. So please, Andre, let's go ahead with Q and A. Great. Well, uh, we have a question made by Martin, Martin Spring and direct to Anesh. Uh, I saw Anesh, you, you put your answer, but I, I, I wish to ask you to, to answer for all of us. And the question uh, is, in the US Canadian system, who decides the thesis research question and when in the process and how it occurs? Uh, so. Please, Anesh. Sure. So normally, um, the, the research question itself is decided by the student. But bear in mind the assumption that that universities in that PhD programs in in sort of the North American system begins with is that at the start of the program, students know very little. So they may have a master's degree, an MBA, sometimes only an undergrad. So the assumption, starting assumptions, they know very little at the start. So they'll be like, okay, I want to write about organizational culture. Well, that's a massive topic. They don't quite understand just how big the topics often are. And they often are trying to um, boil the proverbial ocean. That's, you know, they're trying to take on way too big of a problem. So the idea is that after two years of full-time intensive coursework, 
um, um, you then take, um, it, you then write your comprehensive exams. And then once you pass your comprehensive exams, that's a signal that you have a significant grasp of the extant literature and the debates that are going on in your field. And once you've done that, at that point, you're able to construct a committee, your dissertation committee, and you develop the research question. So the idea is that you develop your research question, and then it, that research question is further refined in consultation with your committee members, your PhD advisor and the committee members. Um, but that's, again, at least where I was trained, that was done pretty much at sort of at the end of your second year, start of your third year is when you're beginning to really define that research question. It's of course informed by the papers you may have written for your coursework in previous in the previous two years, but um, it's really defined um, at, the, at that later stage. Thanks very much. Well, well uh, there's a question for Monica. Uh, it was made by Chabi Benoit and uh, how has the private sector been integrated or let's say co-opted into the PhD programs at, at Mexico? Sí, um, el sector privado normalmente colabora y está integrado con los programas doctorales del, del sector privado. Así es, es eh, efectivamente de las universidades privadas. Esto quiere decir que, por ejemplo, las universidades públicas, que su gran mayoría, como lo mostraba este, en la gráfica, este, apenas comienzan a colaborar eh, con la iniciativa privada. Eh, ya ves que los programas doctorales en su mayoría de, de, de la educación pública son de, de investigación. Entonces, comienzan a colaborar, colaborar están reacios, eh, sin embargo, apenas comienzan a abrirse, a, a compartir mejores prácticas, a abrirse a esas investigaciones y sobre todo, este, digamos, a, a compartir justamente esas mejores prácticas con otras empresas. Ok. Great, thanks, Monica. Okay. Sergio, I don't know if uh, you want to make some instant translation yeah yeah monica when when you put your last slide on the problems in mexico i thought you were talking about brazil <laughs> i will <laughs> just i'll just copy and paste that slide to end any presentation i made about the brazilian situation in phd so as as we are in mexico talking about private. Uh, in, in Brazil now, we have the private sector growing even more, whereas the public is going under stress. So basically, government has been cutting down budgets, similar to what uh, Lionel said about funding PhD students in, in France. So basically now on the, un, uh, on the undergraduate level, and of course, same reflects on graduate level, private sector is approaching to 90%, 90% of the total undergraduate and same reflects on, on the graduate level. So first to Monica, but addressing to all of you, I, I believe this is a problem of a, a real problem in developing world and in the developed world, it's on, on the uh, low, still a problem, but in a lower scale. So, uh, and then there is a problem of regulation, same as Birahim pointed out by the federal authorities on, on quality of, of the programs. So how, how do you see Monica in Mexico, this big percentage of the private and how is quality assurance by the federal government? So 
Okay, Sergio, I, I think for the next question, I, I, I don't know, even know, Monica, maybe you, you speak again? No. Well, okay, Sergio, I don't need, I really need you for the next question because uh, Clarissa Cabral made a question in French and <laughs> I really don't, I really can't read in French. So maybe you can look at the Q&A, it's on the answer. The yeah, Birahim was, I saw Birahim was typing the reply. It appeared yeah. on my <laughs> screen, Birahim is typing the reply. Yeah, but maybe he could, could share his his answer with all of us. But he uh, did not he did not write there. I don't know if he finished or not. <laughs> uh, oui, si 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 vous voulez, en fait, je peux partager la uh, réponse uh, adressée à. Uh, yeah, the, la, yes. Uh, the, the question is from Cla Clarissa Cabrauleti. She exactly. says she says that uh, you said that the mission process for the PhD is very demanding, very high level. And then she asks where, whether you think that this is due to the low level of the quality pre preparing the students at the, at the graduate, undergraduate level, because she says, this is the same problem we have in Brazil. So basically at the undergraduate level, the preparation is not really sufficient to prepare the students to pass the PhD admission. How, so c'est un problème de la préparation du niveau immédiatement en bas de, de, de programme doctoral où l'exigence de doctorat c'est vraiment n'importe quelle est la formation. En fait, le problème qui se pose est euh, la question de Clarissa, c'est euh, pourquoi le parcours euh, Bien, l'accession la, la, au niveau doctorat est difficile. Euh, Est-ce un problème euh, de qualité de formation au niveau undergraduate ou bien est-ce un problème autre? Euh, je, je réponds que euh, sur le plan administratif, euh, l'inscription euh, au doctorat est difficile et exigeante. Euh, par contre, euh, concrètement, Aujourd'hui, on a euh, une question au doctorat euh, qui n'est pas très clairement euh, institutionnalisée de manière rigoureuse euh, parce qu'on a des profils variables qui sont acceptés au doctorat, euh, des personnes avec euh, des niveaux et des formations différentes, et ce qui crée une certaine hétérogénéité euh, dans l'encadrement et des difficultés à suivre les euh, doctorants qui ont un niveau suffisant. À partir de ce moment-là, on a du mal à avoir des résultats euh, suffisants. Donc, c'est un problème euh, de niveau de formation au niveau undergraduate. Ça peut aussi être un problème de sélection des candidats et toutes choses qu'il mériterait de euh, traiter de manière rigoureuse. Euh, voilà la euh, réponse que je peux donner à cette question. Merci, Biral. So it is indeed a problem on the formation at the undergraduate level, but also a problem in the diversity of students that are admitted at the PhD level because there is no strict standardization for the admission process at the PhD. So when you have uh, people from different levels entering the PhD, then of course you're gonna have uh, different endings for this formation on the PhD will to also be in very different levels. That's correct. That's correct, Birahim. So diversity at entry, not standardized. And then at the end, as you said on the first speech, 
you do get good dissertations, but you may have dissertations that exactly. you, would, you would not consider to be a full, exactly. a, exactly. full, a full dissertation. Exactly, it's correct. So uh, any of the panelists would like to comment on this uh, problem that uh, Monica pointed out and that uh, we do have in Brazil, the private segment advancing and uh, squeezing the public sector, which at the end is responsible for the accreditation and the quality of the PhD programs. I can, I can give a view, you know, it, because in France, we really also have this dual system with public universities and business schools that are not affiliated with universities. And something that is very interesting is that about 95% of the PhD students are trained in public universities. And, uh, but then they leave the public sector in order to get better paid uh, in, uh, in business schools. Um, so, so the public sectors take charge of all the costs of uh, training future researchers, and then the business schools just uh, collect uh, these because they they wouldn't have uh, the financial care. Or they, they could have, but they don't. They don't uh, allocate uh, fundings to a PhD program. They 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 rely on public uh, universities in order to training good researchers and then they can hire them, uh, which is quite different, for example, in the UK, in which business schools are within universities. So uh, it's the same people who uh, train researchers and who hire researchers. So I think that the, this dual system is, is, quite, um, is quite embarrassing for, for the countries in which we have like two, let's say, speeds uh, uh, or, or two types of markets uh, for PhD student and for uh, let's say junior researchers, and of course senior researchers as well. Lee, you want to comment? Uh, yeah. Well, I, I learned because I'm very surprised to hear different systems in different countries. Uh, Thailand is more like to follow uh, U.S. U.S. standard plus some of the British. And in terms of uh, the school I'm working at, the Assumption University, they are using U.S. system. So we are focused on executive program in last uh, about last ten years. We are more focused on those professions. We want to engage profession uh, professional who can learn research knowledge and they can conduct uh, research at their own organization. That is the first aim. Then hopefully <clears throat> they can share some, uh, some of the insights because the, the pure scholar, they can hardly get involved on in regular business research. It is not easy, but then the, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, the external environment had been changing rapidly. We really need um, the research in different perspective at different levels in the society. Thank you, Lee. Lionel, okay. in, Bra in Brazil, it's the very same. The public sector takes the cost to form master and PhD that then go to teach in the private sector. So. Mm -hmm. Just to give big, Brazil is also only big numbers, right? So in 20 years, the private sector moved from one and a half million students to six and a half million students. So four times, four and a half times more. And of course, all the burden to form these professors were taken by the public sector. Uh, I'm afraid we are coming to the end of our panel here. I, I put here in, in the chat a link to a fresh research. That's why Leonella had Idamba on my mind. 
I just came across this week on preparation for the panel to this report on, mm -hmm. on doctor education across the globe. So A ASCB together with Adamba prepared this, just came out this year, but uh, the closing point is just before pandemic. So maybe it's, it will give a, a good cut. So anybody interested in moving on, studying PhD education across the globe. I think this is a very important source of information there. It's a 80, 80 page presentation on PDF. So thank you all very much for your time, for generosity to share your view with us. I think we did learn a lot today from different perspectives on teaching education across continents like we suggested. And uh, I wish you a good day and uh, hopefully we soon meet again around here. Have a good day. <laughs>